off to go see the Midway. I'm going to uh, take a dinghy ride all the way across the, the bay here and then uh, go visit the Midway Museum, possibly the Star of India and the Maritime Museum that's there as well. So uh, saying goodbye to Lost Pearl for the moment and making sure she's ship shape while I uh, head off. Day. From the northeast corner of Shelter Island, I took the dinghy all the way past Harbor Island and close to where there is a Coast Guard station. This was the longest distance that I've gone by the dinghy at about four and a half kilometers. There's conveniently a dinghy dock here where I could tie up for the afternoon. It's right by the Coast Guard station and it looked like they were doing some hover training. I still wasn't that close, as the midway is back here. Time to get walking. I walked along the Embarcadero for about two kilometers, a lovely waterfront area with cruise ship docks and the Maritime Museum. And then there, looming large, was the midway. The first part of the museum is dedicated to the Battle of Midway, the ship's namesake. There is a really good theater presentation detailing the Battle of Midway and some really interesting personal stories. The US Navy's decisive victory in the air-sea battle in June of 1942 effectively changed the course of the war in the Pacific. The rest of the flight deck had a variety of displays and flight simulators as well as a shop and a restaurant that had yet still to be opened. There was also this transparent model of the Midway that was constructed before the ship was commissioned. As well as a model of the new Ford class supercarrier next to the very first aircraft carrier. Then it was time to head up onto the flight deck. The USS Midway was commissioned one week after the end of World War II in 1945, and for 10 years she was the largest ship in the world. She served for 47 years and saw action in Vietnam and was the flagship for Operation Desert Storm back in 1991. She was decommissioned in 1992 and of course now is a museum. She weighs 64,000 tons and is 1,001 feet long. She's 238 feet wide on the flight deck. Let's have a closer look at some of the display aircraft. Well, maybe not this close. This is an F-4 Phantom II, and it was the first jet to see extensive combat service with the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force. It is a multi-purpose aircraft, and can do bombing missions, close support of troops, and dogfighting. It was eventually replaced by the F-14 Tomcat. On display were also every type of helicopter that has ever flown off the deck of the Midway, including this iconic Huey gunship. In 1966, Army helicopter gunships flew in support of Navy patrol boats in Vietnam's Mekong River. But the Navy decided to form what became the Helicopter Attack Squadron, nicknamed the Sea Wolves. By 1973, the Sea Wolves had flown 78,000 missions in support of special forces, patrol boats, and infantry units. HAL 3 crew members were also awarded more than 17,000 medals, making the Sea Wolves the most decorated squadron in naval aviation. It was nice that they had displays where you could actually look inside some of the aircraft to see what they looked like during operations. Not all the aircraft on display were combat related, like the C-1 Trader cargo aircraft. It performed crucial tasks such as carrying passengers, priority repair parts, evacuating patients, and especially delivering the mail. One of the great things about the museum is they actually have veterans with first-hand experience on working on an aircraft carrier explaining some of the displays, including landing and taking off. 
There are also mannequin displays like this shooter, depicting one of the many people involved in launching an aircraft. Right beside the midway is a lovely park. There is a large statue depicting the iconic photograph of a U.S. Navy sailor kissing a total stranger, celebrating the end of World War II in the Pacific. It was time to head below decks and see the inner workings of this massive ship. The ceiling height was a little low for a guy like me. I found out later that the designers had decreased the ceiling height by a foot to accommodate the thickness of the armored flight deck. Unfortunately, the bridge tour was closed, so I could not see that portion of the ship. The first areas that I encountered were more offices and meeting rooms where the Admiralty would discuss their plans. I encountered a variety of rooms, including a communications room and other meeting rooms for high-ranking officers that even had their own attached kitchen to them. Then it was on to CIC, where the screens were still depicting information from Desert Storm. I headed down a number of stairs and deeper into the ship and came upon the operating room and the very well equipped dental clinic. Another set of stairs led me down to the CPO mess. Here there were recreation areas and a barber shop. Then it was on to the all-important food service areas. They served 14,000 meals a day through the various kitchens on board. The recipe book reminded me of my father's. As my father was an institutional cook, he also had recipes that were listed for 100 people per batch. This Hobart stand mixer is identical to the type that I used for many, many years during my baking career. They served 10 tons of food a day, four and a half thousand pounds of beef per meal when it was served, and 3,000 pounds of potatoes per day. A thousand loaves of bread were made a day in the two bakeries that were on board. I spent a number of hours on board, but I still did not see everything. I think I completely missed the engine room, either that or it was closed off.
I highly recommend visiting the museum if you're ever in the San Diego area. It is well laid out and very educational. And it is truly impressive to be on such a massive, iconic ship as the USS Midway.